I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here, but I can't stand. Pop off. <laughs> you know what really grinds my gears? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the episode. Before we begin, a reminder that our listeners can ask us a question, any question, about anything, totally free, by emailing us at basicallyrelatedpodcast at gmail.com. So today, it's just Father Jonathan and I. Yes. But Matthew has not departed us yet. K-I-A. Yes. M-I-A. <laughs> M-I-A. K-I-A. M-I-A. <laughs> no, he's uh, uh, just been a little under the weather. Uh, but he will he will be back. Yes, he we'll we'll have him for a few more episodes um, before uh, he begins uh, his own uh, adventure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in his, in <laughs> right. his artistry and his own podcast. Um, but he, yeah, he's just uh, feeling a little sick, and so he's not joining us today. So, but we are back to our normal talking about the readings. Yes, for the nineteenth Sunday of Ordinary Time. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, 19th okay. Sunday of Ordinary Time. Last week, um, the Transfiguration trumped the 18th Sunday of yes. Ordinary Time, um, as it should. That is right, it's right and just. And so um, we, uh, we didn't get to talk about the 18th Sunday of Ordinary Time, but here we are with the 19th Sunday. Year A, so we're re- good at getting our, making our way through Matthew. So. Yeah, so last week we talked about the Transfiguration, which had Moses and Elijah, mm-hmm. and then this week, the first reading has Elijah. Elijah, yep. And a very classic, or very well-known uh, instance, mm-hmm. our, our episode or scene with Elijah, where he goes up to Mount Horeb and has the, the theophany mm-hmm. with, with God, where God uh, is not, where God passes by, there's, a, there's thunder, there's lightning, there's earthquakes, but God is in none of these. Instead, he appears to Elijah in a small, tiny whisper. Yes. He says that Elijah goes out <clears throat> in the cave, uh, out of the cave, and covers his face yep. to receive this revelation. You yep. know, as you know, as a Carmelite, this is a this is a very popular passage. Yes, I can it's, imagine. It's, yes, very, <laughs> very well documented and uh you know the medieval Carmelites commented on it a lot about what was, what did this mean that uh, Elijah was in a cave, mm-hmm. and then he, you know, God was in all these, you know, stormy events. Right. This, the 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 um, idea of silence too is in here too. Yes. Right. And so you know, I think this is a great passage for um, like a basis of prayer. Yes. Uh, and so yeah, there's a lot here, and I see as a Carmelite, I can understand. Um, I'm not a Carmelite. <laughs> but I can understand uh, the Carmelites' um, attraction with this uh, um, verse. Right. They 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 take it as a uh, as a moment of of exemplifying contemplation. Right. Right. Like give exactly. Kind of the, the noise of the world or the yep. noise of temptation and and uh, attachments, but God is not in all these grand things. He's in this tiny whispering sound. Right. That the first reading says, um, Saint John the Cross. Obviously, <laughs> comments on this um, that Elijah hears this tiny whispering, but then he then Elijah goes out of the cave and hides his face with his cloak, mm. and he says, uh, Saint John says that this hiding uh, Elijah's face with his cloak is a a sign of covering his mind or his intellect before the presence of God, because um, anything that he might, anything that Elijah might understand about God. Is actually much further than who God really is. Interesting. So the, it's kind of this um, via negativa, yeah, uh, of the Carmelites that God is not who you think He is, right? In, in a sense, and that's um, it kind of reminds me of um, Abraham when uh, he was asked by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. Uh, there was no. Saint Paul has a great commentary on um, on that passage of Abraham's calling, uh, because Abraham was. Uh, called to sacrifice his son Isaac, and at the same time was also promised to be the father of many nations. Right. And so St. Paul says he thus reasoned that God would raise his son Isaac from the dead. That right. was that was his reasoning. And uh, what reminded me um, uh, of that from our first reading uh, with uh, this episode from Elijah, what you were just saying, is that by reason alone, uh, you can't come to understand the ways of God. Right. Right. Uh, and so, 
you know, with with Abraham, we see this hope in the resurrection, <laughs> even though you know he he was um, way before Christ's time. Right. Um, and then with Elijah, you see this idea that um, he's covering himself, like his human fa- um, you know, um, faculties um, are, in a sense, cloaked, well, literally cloaked, um, as he stands at the entrance of the, of the cave. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, because uh, that passage from from uh, the letter to the Hebrews about Abraham is often, or in, in that episode with Abraham, is often taken as like this moment of like pure obedience, right? Mm-hmm. Pure submission. Yeah. Um, just... Don't think about it. Just God said so. Kind of a div- divine command theory, almost. But it's actually, if you if you le- read that commentary, it's actually a commentary on Abraham's extreme faith and hope. Yeah, right. It says, hoping against hope, he had faith that in some way he would he would get Isaac or he would get his son back. Right. Right. Against all all, all that. So it wasn't just this. Well, if you want me to, I will. Yeah. It, it was actually a demonstration of faith and hope. Yeah. Um, right. Against all that, but. I, I, and you also yeah. made a point about um, kind of uh, covering your faculties, and that's a good way to put it. It's not, you know, what St. John the Cross is saying is that Elijah didn't just, you know, blind his mind, but it was more of realizing that he now needed faith yeah. to understand this moment, right. not understand. And isn't it. isn't that how Paul, you know, speaks about faith? He says, like, put on Christ, like, yes. put on, you know, yeah. and so this idea of, like, hiding his face, face he's, like, putting on something else, yes. right? Yes. Um, that's that's not necessarily contradictory to his faculties, but something that allows it to to act more properly, if if that's the right way to put it. Um, yeah, and and I think the idea of you know you mentioned faith and hope. Um, that's the um, the theme that I I got from all these readings today uh, was one of hope. Uh, you know, going turning to our gospel. Um, and you know, I'm not saying that we have to leave behind the first reading entirely. We're going to come back to that uh, and see the connections um, uh, that you know that we um, that were brought to our attention. But um, the gospel is the familiar passage of uh, Jesus walking on water and uh, call uh, and and Christ calling out to Peter, saying um, to, to to inviting him to walk on the water as well. Um, What's very uh, th- there's a lot of symbolic imagery going on in this passage. Um, the, the passage begins with um, after feeding uh, Christ feeding the people, he uh, goes up on a mountain to pray by himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so immediately we're we're seen we're given this image of the mountain, which is very symbolic of um, uh, God's presence. Right. Yep. This is yeah. where um, you know. This is where we get the idea of the holy mountain, Mount Zion, the place of um, dwelling um, for our Lord. Uh, and he goes by himself to pray. Um, there's an immediate connection there with uh, Elijah. Um, you know, going uh, and entering like alone uh, in silence in prayer. Um, but then we're immediately given a um, the image of the sea, uh, which is uh, a symbol of chaos and death, right? Think about the flood, uh, Leviathan, right, who dwells in the depths of the sea. Right. Uh, And this is where um, the action of the gospel really takes place. Uh, In the midst of, let me see if I'm getting this right. Yes. So uh, there is a storm at sea. Um, So the disciples are in a boat and it's being tossed about by the waves for the wind was against it, as St. Matthew says. and during the night, so immediately you have this like darkness, sea, a storm. Uh, it, it's it's all symbolic, I think, of just chaos and death. Right. right? I would say those are um, all the classic symbols yes, and, and images yeah. of of that. And and so now you see Christ walking on water, and for me, it's very apparent. Like when you understand that the, the symbolism of the ocean uh, and uh, how it relates to chaos and death, Christ is subduing. The chaos, essentially, right? Right. He comes from this mountain, um, the, the the heights of God, uh, where God dwells, and he descends the mountain in order to uh, placate the chaos. Right. right. Um, it's it's almost like a prefigurement of his uh, of what he will do on the cross. Right. Um, mm. uh, essentially, just uh, the ultimate act of destroying death and chaos. Um, anyway, that's that's the imagery that. Um, uh, leapt out at me. Uh, 
then he says, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And then Peter says, Lord, is, if it is you, command me to come uh, to you on the water. And he, says, and he says, come. Now, this is where Peter begins to um, falter <laughs> a little bit. Uh, he gets out of this boat and began, he, so he began to walk on water toward Jesus. So it's not like immediately he begins to sink. Right. Because I think this is connected to him still looking at our Lord. You know, he's talking to our Lord at this point. He says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to the water. And he says, come. So he's already having a conversation with Christ. And I think it's that connection to Christ that allows him to walk on water. Yeah, I think that's right. Because um, it says Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water towards Christ. But when he saw how the water, when he saw when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened. Yeah, so exactly. This is a shifting of sight. That conjunction, the but right? Yeah, right. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened and began to sink. So the cause of him sinking was that he noticed the chaos right. around him, and that's when he became frightened and he sank. Uh, and then our Lord stretches out his hand and caught Peter and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So that, that, for me, that's the, the, the crux of the reading. Uh, it's, it's, it's Peter turning to his focus toward the chaos and focusing on that, which implies that he lost focus on what mattered, on, on right. Christ himself. Uh, it's interesting that you have... The, the storm and the wind and Peter focusing on that uh, when in our first reading, Elijah seems to be, I don't want to say distracted. Uh, I think um, distracted is the wrong word, but he notices. He notices a strong and heavy wind that was rending the mountains and crushing rocks before the Lord. But then the, the author of Kings points out, but the Lord was not in the wind, Right. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. So Elijah, kind of like Peter, you know, I'm making my way through this now. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> Elijah, kind of like Peter, notices notices the things around him, uh, notices the power of nature. Mm -hmm. um, and these are frightening things, right? Like wind that is enough to rend the mountains, crushing rocks, um, an earthquake, fire, all these things are frightening. And Elijah is not um, blind to them. You know, he, again, he's, he's noticing them, but he's noticing that that's not where his Lord is. His Lord is in a tiny whispering sound. And so like Peter, <clears throat> he notices these things, but I think where Peter went wrong and where Elijah succeeded is that Elijah was able to enter into a kind of silence and right. to notice the Lord in that silence. Right. It's a small whispering wind. Um, that, that's the, the, that's why he's part, partly why he's an example of the contemplative life. Yes. Of, of blocking out these other sounds, yeah. these other things and realizing and, and knowing or are being sensitive enough to know when the Lord speaks. Yeah. And exactly. in what way he speaks in the way is in this tiny whispering. Yeah. And he's able to respond. Exactly. And it, it's in that silence. You know, I think silence, um, is so crucial for a healthy prayer life. And oftentimes, I think, um, people can approach prayer thinking that they have to be constantly talking or mm -hmm. they have to feel um, God's presence. Right. And, and so it's done with, like, lots of sentimental music and it's, you know, it's, it's trying to rile your emotions. Um, but I think prayer, uh, most authentically, um, is shown in just silence and a kind of like a settling with our Lord. Yeah, um, yeah, in a in a modern twist on a, a saying from Saint John on the Cross, one of God's love languages is silence. You know, the, <laughs> <laughs> the sixth lo love yeah, language, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, he says that that's like the the silent language of love. Yeah. You know, that just right. being, uh, I think it's Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity, being alone with with the alone. You know, kind yes. of um, uh, just being quiet. Yeah, before God, is, right. That's actually where. You, that's where you have these, these powerful experiences. It's, yeah. it's not necessarily in these grand moments and the you yeah. know, earth-shattering moments yeah. and, and miracles, but it's actually in this, this tiny, tiny whispering right. of God. There's a, um, I don't remember the source, but I think there's an antiphon in, uh, in one of the, in evening prayer um, 
for one feast day. I can't remember what it was. It might not even be in the Roman Rite. It might be Eastern. I'm, I, yeah, again, I don't remember. <laughs> but someone t- showed this antiphon to me. And it was um, uh, it was Christ. It, it, it praises Christ. It says, Christ, the affirmation of those who pray in silence, essentially. Um, and it was really beautiful because we were just, I remember I was having a conversation with this person and we were just talking about um, these different um, charisms um, that approach worship differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and one that's just, you know very popular with the youth, the youths, <laughs> popular <laughs> the, young, with the, the young people, the, the youngins, yeah, <laughs> um, is you know a, a lot of music and emotion. Um, but sometimes I think we we just lose that sense of uh, real connectedness connectedness to our Lord when we um you know we maybe we don't trust people to pray in silence right it's like mm-hmm. oh let me let me pray for them right like let me give them prayer. Um, but but again, he yeah that 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 antiphon saying like the Christ is the affirmation of those who pray in silence. Um, it, it's kind of just a beautiful way to think about prayer. Yeah, it's silent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think uh, <clears throat> this you know the first reading with Elijah in in the cave and 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 the tiny whispering sound, and then the beginning of the gospel have a great connection. He said they're but they're both on mountaintops, mm-hmm. which are classic revelation spots and. And theophanies, um, but also Christ is is alone. Yes, on this on this mountaintop praying. So again, there's this element of aloneness and of silence. And if the if we if the reading continued from the first reading, um, Elijah receives a commission from God. That's where uh, that's right. And he says, "I'm most zealous for you. I'm the you know I'm basically the last prophet. I'm the last faithful person." Yeah. Um, this is after his conflict with the prophets of Baal. Yep. And then that's where he goes and kind of makes his disciples. But He's a hunted man at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. Um, but analogously, you know, you have in the gospel, Christ is in communion with his father on the mountain, and then he goes down into the, into chaos. So, you know, you, mm, kind of yeah. the lesson for both is yep. if if you want, you know, strength in a sense to, to face Persecution in the sense in uh, Elijah's case, or uh, the chaos of life, you you kind of have it has to precede. Prayer has to precede that. Yeah, you know if you know Christ is is literally in this passage as you pointed out above the chaos. Yeah, but in order for that to happen, I think you have to be rooted in prayer. Yeah, first. Yeah, exactly. And um, this is where that uh, theme of hope that I alluded to earlier really comes into play. Uh, Essentially, I think Peter's um, downfall uh, is can be analogous to um, a life given to despair. I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here, but I can't stand. Pop off. <laughs> you know what really grinds my gears? <laughs> um, no, so th- there's a an idea in modern Christianity that um, we have to live in this present moment in order to find grace and. Part of that is true. You know, we grace happens in the now, right? You, mm-hmm. you get grace in the now. You also fall out of grace in the now. Um, but I think um, some some ideas that are a little foreign to Christianity, like mindfulness, um, have snuck its way into um, the faith, at least modern expressions of the faith, um, to where we focus so much on the present moment that we forget the virtue of hope. Mm-hmm. Um, hope is... Essentially, uh, uh, hope is seeing something in the future that is difficult to obtain, and um, be- like having the faith to obtain it. Right? Um, it's future oriented. Um, that is not a catechism definition, but I, <laughs> I think on a natural level we can say that that's what hope is. Yes, it, it's it's looking forward to the future to obtain something good. Um, that is, in its very nature, kind of difficult to obtain. Right, you don't hope that you're going to have breakfast because that's, you know, at least for me, <laughs> some people actually actually might hope for you know having right. breakfast, but for most of us, and that's something that we can attain easily. So you don't hope for breakfast, right? You're you're looking forward to it maybe. Um, so by its nature, it has to be difficult to attain. Uh, it's future oriented, and so that's why I think it's antithetical. Hope, the virtue of hope, is antithetical to this present moment mentality, uh, and I think in our gospel. Um, it, it, it displays that quite well. Peter is, if he was just living in the present moment on the sea, 
would just be focused on the wind and the chaos. That's what's happening to him in the now, right? right? Uh, but in order to come to salvation, he has to focus on Christ. He has to be future-oriented. Um, it's when he turns his eyes away from our Lord, that which, you know, our Lord is saying, come. He's not just saying walk randomly on water, but he's like, I am the goal, so mm-hmm. you come to me, right? right. Uh, and Peter is not there yet. That's the future, though. The fu- what awaits Peter if he has faith, is Christ standing on top of the water. But when Peter turns his eyes away from that, focuses on the present moment, he essentially loses hope. Um, and that's when he sinks. Well, that's very uh, that's very evident in, in Pauline literature. And I think even last week with uh, the reading from uh, St. Peter, you know, keep your eyes kind of, fixed. Keep, keep yeah. your eyes as, as a lamp in the darkness. Right, right. So, you that's know, true. You know, you have Christ on the water. Keep your eyes fixed on there. I think yeah. uh, Saint Paul talks about you know almost like the finish line, running the race. Keep your eyes, keep your eyes on the prize. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Totally. Um, because it it does say, as we pointed out before, that when he saw the water, so clearly he took his eyes, his his attention, his focus away from Christ. Yeah. Yep. He said, um, and that's when in his in his present situation, that's when he began to sink. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And. Um, that's a really good connection with um, the Transfiguration readings, which we, again, we celebrated last Sunday, the Transfiguration of our Lord. Um, that second reading is written by Peter. And so you can almost imagine that, you know, when Peter's talking about a lamp shining in a dark place, and he says, you'll be well to fix your attention on it. Yes. Um, you can almost imagine, like, him almost recalling Christ walking in the, in the evening amidst this chaos, um, and Christ being that light. Wow. You know? Yeah, I actually um, hadn't considered that. But yeah, yeah, but it's, it's like yeah. Peter, ta- you know, encouraging us to f- keep our eyes fixed on the light. And in the Gospels, we see him struggling to fix yeah. his eyes on the light. Yeah, you know? Let, let's let's keep that because um, it does say that Christ came during the fourth watch of the night. Yeah, in in the night, I and that. I think fourth fourth watch was, I think it was, um, I think it's three a.m. to dawn. Is that right? I think is is the fourth the hour, watch. The, hour, um, the opposite hour of mercy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so if we go with the dawn imagery, yeah. remember in the same reading from St. Peter, he said um, That's right. that... Uh, until the dawn uh, until rises. The, until the dawn rises. Right. Um, and I know uh, Ludolf of Saxony, you know, a great... <laughs> a, a very popular commentator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A very popular commentator <laughs> on this. He was popular in the medieval period. Um, there you go. Okay. Uh, kind of the spiritual interpretation of this gospel is, you know, if you if you hold out um, through temptation and 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 the kind of battering of the storms of your life, and you you know, kind of call out for you know, supernatural protection, mm. the Lord comes like the morning star. Mm, he says he comes, he scatters the darkness, and you know calms temptations and calms right. the tempest of the storm. But that's all. That's, yeah. that's all from Saint Peter. You know, that's yeah. That's, um, I'm going back to the reading of the Transfiguration. Yeah, I know. I know. Th- um, I know. This is about Sunday, but I know. there's well, so many connections. But uh, yeah, and and the thing is, like the fact that it was um, the second leader from Saint Peter, right? Right. Um, and and Peter features prominently in our gospel for today. It's relevant. Um, it's, it's very related. Rele- it's, it's basically related. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, right. I'm just reading. Yeah, you will do well to be attentive. To it, the prophetic message. He's talking about scripture. Mm -hmm. Um, As to a lamp shining in a dark place until day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. There's no way he's not thinking about Christ as like that morning star and the day. Right. Um, Especially if the fourth watch is right before dawn. Um, It's like, it's almost like Christ as that rising sun. Right. They're looking forward to. Um, Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, because all the kind of mystical imagery in this is Christ. Again, literally above chaos. Chaos has yep. has no power over him. Yeah. Um, darkness has no power over him, and in in, in he is the morning star. Yep. He, he is that which scatters the darkness, and yeah. and subdues the storms. Right, and because it says, um, after Jesus caught Peter, um, and said, "Oh, you have little faith. Why do you doubt?" Matthew makes a note that after they got into the boat, the wind died down. 
And so it's almost like Christ joining them and the chaos is subdued. Right. And then after they are able to see that the chaos has been subdued, Christ is now with them. That's when they say, truly, you are the son of God. There's like a recognition of his divinity. Yes. Um, because ultimately, that is the ultimate. That that is the manifestation of his divinity: is being able to control nature um, and ward off the great enemies of man, which is suffering, death, chaos. Right. So, right, you can take it in a natural, a more natural sense of the the, the physical storms themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, there's lots of uh, references to this in the Old Testament in. Exodus, you know, then crossing the river yes, or crossing right. the, the Jordan, yep. you have, or I'm sorry, the Red Sea. Yeah. Um, then later the Jordan, and uh, you also have the Psalms. You know, there's, uh, you know, from praying the bravery that there's all these Psalms about how God is, is commander of, of the storms, yeah. or He rides on on storms, or yep. what, you know, whatever yeah. it is. And so you have that sense in which Christ is is showing His divine power of one who masters the storms. Mm-hmm. And then more mystically, you're right. You can, uh, you can um, interpret the storms as that which happens to you from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Yeah. Oh, you right. Can, you know, sure. Try to take it. Yeah. Either way. Right. Right. Yeah, that's but good stuff. Staying on that, um, I also thought of uh, from Ratzinger's uh, introduction to Christianity, where he talks about uh, was it Christian hope is like hanging onto a plank of wood. Oh yeah, it's... that's a beautiful um, section. That was in the beginning of his book. Yes. Yeah. Um, right. And he, he yeah, essentially he says um, like we're given into the temptation of doubt, um, and if we're focused on the chaos around us, um, it's very easy to despair. Essentially, mm-hmm. uh, but we have like it's it's ma- taking that leap of faith and saying, I do believe that there's something beyond this chaos and death. Um, and yeah, so uh, yeah, and it's the same Im- imagery as um, a great ocean, right? right? The sea, the water is always that is that is that like everlasting symbol of chaos and, and death. Um, and so sometimes that that plank of wood can just seem like it's it's nothing, but at the same time, it's all that's keeping you afloat. And sometimes that's all that matters, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, sometimes. Um, going off of that um, theme of hope a little bit more too, I think it's so essential. That um, we really take this lesson from Peter, uh, and and look forward to a goal that we can actually visualize. Um, you know, I, I was uh, one one great example that I love for the virtue of hope is um, you know the people who constructed the medieval cathedrals. Um, yeah. It, you know, they. I think Peterson uses this example too. Um, I can't remember the ex- exactly the way he puts it, but essentially, some of these cathedrals took two, three hundred years, four hundred years oh, yeah. to build. And to be a- to be able to start a project, knowing that you will not see it, your children will not see it, your children's children will not see the completed project, and to spend your life like building this thing is Christian hope. Yeah. Like there is no other power that can, that can, that can motivate you to build something like that for the yeah. future, right? Um, I think we're like, and that's one of the big reasons why I think we're not going to see these great cathedrals in our days now, because I think modernity is just not used to seeing that far into the future. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, in, around the city here, Charlotte, there's new apartments. Popping up all the time. Yes, and, it's like, and, in less and than two months, it's like a brand new apartment. Right, and like there's constant construction, and everybody just wants it immediately. Yeah, you know, exactly. These apartments are popping up year after yep. year, and so like, we're used to that. Like and the financial sense, for, and yeah. you know all that. Like you know, it's we're so short sighted. I think as That's modern true. people, it's like we're worried about the bottom line. How do I make a profit? Uh, you know, the, I can get this done quicker than this guy, and so I get the contract. You know, um, but this medieval mindset was so grounded in hope that they were able to build something that just outlasts generations, right? right? Um, and uh, obviously there's so many factors to, to why, um, you know, we're not able to build those things too. Um, but, but I think um, hope is, is, is central to that. Um, it's also, it's a mindset too that like not everything is, you know, for money, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, like they were, they were building because it, it was to give glory to God, right? And, and from what I've heard, um, 
even like the beams that were connected in areas that you couldn't even see were um, decorated and ornate, right? Because they knew that God can see it, right? Like it was, it was right. a sense of yeah. like giving glory to God. Right. There was a medieval sense that God was everywhere at all times and could could see everything. Yeah. So even things, you know, hidden or or not seen by your eyes. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they they don't deserve glory. Right. Exactly. Just, but know. it's that that knowledge that God sees everything is is kind of like what we're getting at the gospels. Like you're fixing your eyes on Christ yeah. and, and realizing that He is present at all times. Yeah. Um, if only you turn to see, you know, don't get distracted by the winds and the, the, the earthquake and the fire, because uh, God is not in that. You know, God is in the, the whispering sound in your heart. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I think that that image of the cathedral is a great image of Christian hope. Uh, I remember a priest talking to me one time about, you know, part of something that Christians have to get comfortable with is the idea that they will never reap what they sow. Yes. That you have to be content mm, right. with just planting seeds yep. and never seeing them grow. Yep. Um, he said this was in the context of you know priestly ministry, but it's the idea that you will evangelize and you will preach and you will hear confessions and you know yep. as a priest you'll, you I mean you'll do everything you know, maybe even with you know your own children, um, but that one day when you aren't there they'll remember something you said. Yeah. Or exactly. they'll remember something that makes them convert or, or has or has a powerful experience on them. But you may never see that in right. your lifetime. I mean, that's yeah. the hope of missionaries and these cathedrals. And I, I think you're right. I think, you yeah. know, just with modern expediency, the idea that we're going to work really, really hard at something and then die and never see the end yeah. of things yeah. is like, oh. like. But like a person without faith, that is a... That is uh, that is a prospect of despair, and it's like why even do that, right? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, this butts up against the um, the philosophy of nihilism. It's like in the end, we all die, so why even work, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Even uh, Ecclesiastes, right? You know, yeah, <laughs> it's all it's, it's all, all vanity. vanity. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was reminded of um, it was two two things actually. Um, going off of that uh, idea, that as Christians we have to get used to the idea that we may never reap what we sow. Um, one is the Gospel of Mark, um, the parable of the sower, where um, he go, he, uh, our Lord says that the farmer goes out and seeds, uh, uh, sows seeds, and then when he goes to sleep, the, um, the grain sprouts. But then he says, though he knows not how. Mm-hmm. And I love that. that. That's like one of my favorite um, parables for the virtue of hope, is that um, we sow the seeds, but we don't know how it's going to grow. Yeah, and you may never point. see it, yeah. right? You, never, you may never see it. Um, and the second thing I was reminded of is um, a quote from Tolkien. Um, he says, uh, "He says, I am a Christian, and indeed a Roman Catholic, so that I do not expect history to be anything but a long defeat, though it contains some samples or glimpses of final victory." Um, and so, just uh, he says, expecting history to be just a long defeat, um, and that's what our lives can feel like: um, defeat after defeat. Uh, we sow our seeds and then we don't see them sprout and we die. <laughs> but do we hope in that final victory? Right. right. Um, and are we working for that? Right. Um, well, that it, changes everything. It, it does. And, you know, something that um, I just thought about last, last week um, when reading a commentary on St. John the Cross was that the Christian life is, is like eschatologically oriented. Mm-hmm. It's oriented to, towards the ultimate things. Yep. And your sufferings in, in the context of St. John the Cross, your mortifications and such and your penances aren't actually for, ultimately, ultimately they're not for any sort of moral correction mm. or growth in holiness, but it's actually, they're eschatologically oriented right. towards the ultimate goal of yeah. things. You know, it's, you know, I think people can kind of focus on, on mortification in this moment. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, just... To deny yourself for the sake of denying yourself, or um, to punish yourself because you're yeah. bad, and or secret dieting when you're fasting, right? Or something. Yeah, yeah, right. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, I've been accused of that of yeah. of making simple meals because I want to grow in holiness, yeah. but actually it's because I'm lazy. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to name names, yeah. but I'm not going to eat today. It's like I just don't want to cook. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and of course, I mean that that is the byproduct, but the idea yeah. isn't. Well, you know what? I'm going to do mortification because I want to be holy. 
Mm-hmm. It's actually you know to make amends for the ultimate goal because I want to for achieve for heaven, salvation. Yeah, achieve exactly. salvation. Right. And of course, again, the, the byproduct might be moral correction mm-hmm. and holiness. Sure, but those but, are side effects, not right. necessarily the the core of what, right, what we're doing. Right. Your eyes should be again on the ultimate goal, yeah. which is Christ. Yeah. Exactly. And, and same thing. Um, I mean, just going back to everything here, just like keeping your eyes focused yeah, on the end. Totally. And that's what um, that's what you know. The mass is is uh, that eschatological symbol, where you know, as you were saying, like we mortify our flesh and we um, do penance and you know take well, not take the discipline. That's like a, a literal term for whipping yourself. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, some, but yes, some we, good 12th century. <laughs> Mortification here. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, all, all the little um, the, the mortifications that we do as Catholics, um, it's united to Christ's suffering, right? And he purifies that and makes it holy. Um, and uh, the Mass as that eschatological, eschatological sign, I was just reading in um, Ratzinger, Spirit of the, Lit- of the Liturgy, uh, making my uh, way through that book again um, in his um, explanation of symbols. And he's, he talks about how uh, when Easter was um, decided, the date of Easter was decided by, was it Trent or Nice? Uh, I can't remember. It was one, I don't know. That's not important. At one of the councils, yeah. it was decided uh, what the day of Easter would be. And it was decided that it would be the, uh, the first Sunday after the full moon after the spring equinox. Um, so it was the, the full moon after the spring equinox, uh, that immediate Sunday following, uh, would be the, um, day for Easter, which is why it's a movable Mm -hmm. feast. Um, but Ratzinger was explaining how, uh, the, the, the moon has always been a a sign, a symbol for temporality. Um, you know, you think of, um, Dante's, um, uh, uh, Paradiso and, and the moon is the, the furthest sphere, um, in, in, in heaven. Uh, and essentially anything under the moon is the realm of death. Um, right. And so this is why, you know, um, like the classic story of werewolves, they, they, you know, they change under the moon. Yes. Because it's, it's a symbol of change and decay. Um, and so that symbol of the moon is now taken up into the symbol of the sun, which is a, a sign for eternity. Mm-hmm. And when we think of Christ as the rising sun and, you know, going back to what Peter said in our in our reading from the Transfiguration, um, that light shining in a dark place until the morning star appears, the sign of eternity. And so at Mass, essentially, with the day of um, the resurrection being decided by that uh, lunar and um, solar symbolism, um, I think the Church is trying to communicate that this, like at the the Mass, we're seeing our end. And we're seeing uh, what, like what all of creation is, is supposed to be. That suffering and death do not have a hold on us anymore because right. of the mass, and so again, like that 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 beautiful imagery of the the moon being taken up into the sun, um, like time being taken up into eternity, through through Christ, right? Um, right. The ever ancient, ever new, you know, that yeah, ma- mass right. takes yeah. place in time, for, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, on on our side, yeah. But yet there's it's an eternal event, yes, of of the of the cross, yeah, exactly. But yet we have secular. You know, seasons and yeah. feasts and such like that. Exactly, and so this this would be my advice <laughs> to anyone <laughs> listening. Um, like, if you're just caught up in like this da- daily grind of just trying, like uh, like eight to five, uh, it feels like you're like meaning is slipping away from your fingers. Like, anchor yourself back into the mass. You know, uh, yeah. I think the mass is just like a good reminder of um, where we're headed. Um, it it takes you out of this present moment ideology and saying like this is what's eternal. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a that's a good point because I I would like to tie that to the the first reading again with Elijah. Um, you know, you have all the chaotic events, and then again the 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 whisper that he focuses on and realizes that like that's God. Mm-hmm. And I think we want, or I want, you know, <laughs> you know, you want you. You, you want like miraculous things to happen, right? You want like yeah. powerful moments, even in prayer. You like you, you just you're looking Give for me a sign. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you want the spectacular things, but it's actually real transformation happens in this small whisper. Yeah, uh, like the 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 tiny things, and 
you know, I, I think we're all kind of prone to want to do, you know, at certain times, like uh, heroic things, you know, we want to do something big and you struggle to think how, how does, you know, how does my day-to-day life make a difference? You know, yeah. it's like the family life is a pillar of society and you're like, yeah, but it doesn't feel like it. Yeah. Right. Like right. it's like, it's just the day in day out, you know, how does, how are changing diapers? Yeah. You know, how does that sustain the world? Right. Right. But if you, but if you think about it, that all these ordinary things can be this tiny whispering yeah. that, that your faithfulness to these small things actually does, in fact, sustain the world. Right. You know, exactly. if you, because if you don't do the small things, it actually will crumble. Right. Every, you know, if you just let it compound. But yeah. that's um, a good point. Yeah. I, I was just thinking about that, that it's a. Uh, it's not in the spectacular, but maybe in the ordinary. Yeah, the absolutely. Hidden, the hidden in ordinary. The tiny whispering sound, and like when 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 a when a parent changes, the, you know, a, a child's diaper, or when a dad goes to work and feeling like it's all for nothing, and it's just you know, what's the end? If if they can reorient themselves and keep their eyes fixed on Christ, and even the smallest things have infinite value. Yeah. Um, and that's why you know I said like mass is so important yeah. to regain that vision because it's. You know, our efforts go into mass, and then from the mass, we um, get meaning to for our efforts as well. Yeah. So it's like this in into mass and out of mass, exit right. at ready to kind of thing. You receive bread um, for the journey. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. Know, yeah, I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that a great place to start is mass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and when it comes to how do I reor- reorient my life or make order yeah. out of this chaos, and even if it's imperfect sacrifice, then that's the whole point of the mass is that um, the bread and the wine is brought by the people. Right, it's made by the people. Um, it, it's fruit of the earth, work of human hands. But then, through Christ's sacrifice, it becomes the bread of life. Yeah. And so, our imperfect offerings become perfect through the mass. And then we leave the mass um, nourished by that which has been made perfect through our imperfect efforts. Um, so, yeah. Well said. Good stuff. Do we want to try for the second reading? <laughs> you know, it's very so. Yeah, before before we started recording, <laughs> Lee and I were just talking about how. Um, the second reading seems to be disconnected from the 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 tri the the cycle um, of the lectionary. We have you know the lectionary is split up into three cycles: your A, B, and C. Uh, and typically, not typically, I think all the time, there's um, a, a clear through line between the first reading, Psalm, and the Gospel. The second reading is always a little bit more of an enigma. <laughs> yeah, it's not intentionally. Connected. Connected. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, the the first reading psalm and gospel yeah. are supposed to be exactly. connected. So in the this second reading is just on a cycle. Exactly. Sometimes it matches up. Sometimes. And it's and it's great. Yeah. But sometimes it yeah. just doesn't. That, um uh, yeah. I don't have really anything to say about the second reading. I don't know if you had something to say. Well it's it's yeah, it's just kind of about I guess the divine prerogatives of is- Israel. It, he's talking about um how Israel does belong to the the new revelation of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, There's just the adoption, the glory, the covenants. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, According to the flesh, yeah, is the Christ who is over all. God bless forever. He, you know, it's fr- it's funny too that he begins his letter um, as um, trying to. It's almost like he's like trying to convince the Romans that like I am not in this for any other reason except that my conscience is uh, aligned with the Holy Spirit. You yeah. know, like, I need to speak this. Um, yeah. Um, he says, I speak the truth of in Christ. I do not lie. My conscience joins with the Holy Spirit in bearing me witness that I have great sorrow and constant anguish in my heart. Um, so is is I think Paul's just being very authentic here. And it's like why he has to say what he has to say. Yeah, um, yeah. It's it's much more, um, you know, the letter to the Romans. He's making it. He's 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 offering some arguments. Yeah. And so this is uh, part of that argument about Israel's adoption. Yep. In, in this, in the promise of Christ. Right. Because, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I, I can imagine like being a Roman citizen was very prestigious, right? Like you, you're granted several rights, um, you know, right. as your citizenship of Rome. And so he says, like, uh, I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people. 
my kindred according to the flesh. Like he's claiming his Roman um, citizenship there, mm -hmm. um, and his Roman identity. But he's saying he's giving credence to the fact that the Israelites were the ones that were chosen. Right. Um, despite, you know, uh, what prestige is to be a Roman. Right. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, he's talking about the Israelites who are part of the covenants and the law and yeah. their worship and the promises, patriarchs, and you know, according to the flesh. But all of that is actually also connected to Christ. Yeah. Who he right. says, is, you know, who's overall. Um, yeah. It, and, and so by being an Israelite, you are connected to Christ. Yeah, and By exactly. being connected to Christ, you are therefore now in his new, uh, now adopted into the new covenant. Yeah, exactly. Right. If you so accept. Yeah. He says that Christ is overall, and he was over the waters. Yeah, I was in just the... trying to think of a. <laughs> I was just thinking, trying to think of something related. Um, right. Once once you recognize that your inheritance uh, is an Israelite, um, you're you're following this great line of patriarchs and Christ. Then you have to look forward to him in hope. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the argument that he makes. You know, elsewhere in his letters is you know. The patriarchs and the prophets saw this day. Mm -hmm. I mean, Christ Himself says it as well. You know, they, you know, Abraham saw my my coming, yeah, and rejoiced in it. And so, uh, Saint Paul is telling his fellow Israelites, "You, you know, our our tradition saw Christ coming, mm -hmm. and this is what they were hoping for. This is this is the the fulfillment is here. Yeah, like come on board, exactly. But yeah, they won't be persuaded. Right? Do you?" Um, we also have uh, the Feast of the Assumption coming up, but we can, we do. That's we can save that the, yeah. for another time. We might, yeah. Let's this is that, that could be like a whole other <laughs> episode. Yeah, I know. You know. Um, now we just have just too much content. Maybe we should start recording like two or three times a week, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think this is a good place to stop. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that was um, you know, we we shared our thoughts on 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 the readings for today and for this coming Sunday. 19th Sunday of Ordinary Time, so... We'll, we'll, give, uh, we'll give the people a, a, an Assumption episode one day. Yes, <laughs> one day. <laughs> or it might be related into some of the um, Sundays that are coming up, too. Um, yeah, mo yeah, more than likely. So, yeah. But I think, um, I think that's a good place to stop, so... All right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Remember, if you have any questions at all, really, about anything, then you can email us at basicallyrelatedpodcast.com at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.